What's up, world? This is Awo Fafore. What's going on, good people? This is Awo Oshayun. Welcome back to the Who Made Y'all Priest podcast, where we talk about our spiritual journeys, our everyday life experiences, and the issues of the times from the perspective of two people who just happen to be priests. Fafore, what's going on, man? Man, nothing much, man. What's good? Man, you know, I'm making it, man. I'm making it. I'm loving, <laughs> loving. I'm loving that we back on the that we back on the turf again, man. That we back in this uh, that we back in podcast mode a little bit now man yeah yeah now i know the people at home probably thinking like man the end of last season y'all said it y'all gonna take y'all a good little break this ain't really a good little break but we still on break though so you know we still on break but we just had something that we wanted to talk to y'all about so we was like we ain't gonna wait until we start dropping episodes again we're gonna go ahead we're gonna hit y'all with this and then we're going to go back to the, to the lab and get back on the grind. You ready to get into this episode? Man, let's do it, man. Let's do it. So two weeks ago. No, no it ain't been two weeks ago. <laughs> it ain't been two weeks? Nope. Today today is like the what? The 28th? Remember, yeah. we got back on the 20th. Yeah. Oh, it ain't been two weeks. It ain't even been two weeks yet. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm tripping. It seemed like so long ago. So anyway... <laughs> <laughs> about a week ago that we got back from uh, taking an international trip to Cuba and the trip was so dope, so amazing, so wonderful that we wanted to go ahead and we wanted to share our experiences with you and we didn't want to wait until, like I said, we started dropping episodes. So we're calling this a special edition. You should feel special. Y'all should feel special, right? <laughs> I, I, I say, I say. Yeah. So, so tell them, tell them about why this trip is so special for you. It was special for me because it's my first time going out of the country. Uh, uh, it's really my first time really being anywhere besides uh, you and I going to VA. That was just about my first time really going anywhere so i'm 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 an older uh, or midlife uh middle aged man that haven't really been uh anywhere so yeah it was my first time uh traveling uh internationally uh i was kind of spooked about <laughs> flying over the water <laughs> I, I i didn't really want to do that part but yeah man i was excited about uh you know finally getting my passport and thinking i was going to get my first stamp on my passport and for some reason the people were stamping the boarding passes. So my uh my passport is still butt naked right now, even though I don't, <laughs> <have it. laughs> I don't like that, man. I don't like that. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, that's wild, man. So this is my second time going to Cuba. I actually detailed my first trip going to Cuba on an episode during season one. So y'all make sure y'all go ahead and check out that episode where I talk about my trip to Cuba in season one, that's on audio only. You have to check that out on Anchor, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that, you know, the audio only version of podcasts are found. So, O'Shea, on your first trip, man, out the country, why Cuba? Um, I really wanted to go somewhere where uh, Ifa and the uh, uh, ancient tradition of our ancestors really had a foothold. So, you know, we thought about other places. We had talked about Colombia. We had talked about Haiti. But I really wanted to go somewhere, either Cuba, uh, Brazil, something like that, where uh, the tradition that we practice really had a, a, a foothold in the culture. I wanted to see what it looked like when Ifa is a part of the culture. It's an everyday thing. It's not separated from um, you know, the rest of our lives from work, from school, from all of those different things. So that's why I wanted to go to Cuba. Yeah, absolutely, man. Cuba definitely has that. Like it is 
intertwined in the culture, whether or not you practice uh, regular de ocha or centuria, lukumi, however you want to call it, whether you practice that or not, you are very familiar with that in Cuba and you respect and you honor it. Because again, whether you practice it is still part of the culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that was that was a dope thing, man. So I've talked to, to people on here many times about you know how I divine every morning for the energy of my day. And I'm very, very particular about that when I travel. And uh, while no Odu is inherently good or bad, it just is what it is, the energy that I do not like to see fall when I'm traveling is ED. Because whenever that has fallen before, and I was on, on a travel day, there definitely was some kind of a delay, some kind of a block, it's something going on. So I absolutely hate to see that energy whenever I'm traveling. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I get up early in the morning because our flight took off over like seven in the morning or something crazy like that. Yeah. yeah, so, you know, we had to get to the airport. It was an international flight. So we had to be there by like five o'clock, five thirty. It might have taken off at like seven thirty, but either way, we had to be, you know, super early in the morning. So I get up and I do my my normal routine with my prayers and things of that nature. And I divine for the energy of my day and I got Ofum. So I'm like, okay, cool. Not bad. Then I do a second casting when I get the nature of my Odu and the nature of my Odu was ED. So immediately I go, oh man, this is going to be crazy. <laughs> like, I'm expecting the delay, right? So <laughs> I, I kind of get finished with that and now I'm rushing. Even though I know I got, under normal circumstances, plenty of time to do what I need to do. I'm packed. I'm not having to pack anything you know, in the morning or anything. It's just getting myself, you know, ready and calling the Uber. But now you beat I'm me rushing. To the yeah, you beat me which, to the airport. <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is, which is crazy. Which yeah, is which is crazy. Of, right? I know, I pulled up. Do. I pulled up with my wife. I was like, look, that go Jimmy right there. That go 5 4 right, right there. He done beat me to the airport. That don't never happen. I already in line and everything. <laughs> so I'm already shook, right? So everything now got to be double time, right? So um, go through security. Um, so no, what's funny is <laughs> the day before we check in, right? Oh, she was trying to check in, but he got an error message. And he like, man, look, my first trip is already some problem. I said, don't worry about it. I, I booked the ticket. I know I'll be able to check us both in. So, um I get there early and I could I go into the kiosk and it wouldn't let me check in, right? So I'm like, oh no, I understand what this is. You know, sometimes we're international, or especially if we're going to Cuba, you know, there's some other things that you kind of gotta do. So I wasn't tripping on that. But I'm thinking to myself, I'm glad Oshayun ain't with me, because then he really would have been like, oh no, man, they got air messages, what's going on? <laughs> so uh I just wait in front of the um, the line where we got to go to to check in, and I intercept him there. And we go check in, right? So everything is smooth, right? We go right through. Everything good. We sit on the plane, ready to go. So they made an announcement, like, "Yo, this is a pretty empty flight. Nobody had to sit in the middle seat. You know, you guys can spread out. You know." Uh, once we, you know, take off, you're good to go, right? So I probably went to bed at midnight and got up at 4 o'clock in the morning. So I look over at OCU and I said, man, I'm about to catch me a good nap on this flight from Houston to Tampa. About two minutes after I said that, right, I'm, I'm down in my seat real good. This, this older lady walks up and she says, um, you guys are like, you're going to be talking on the flight. And I really didn't, like, I understood what she was saying, but I didn't understand what she was saying, right? So I just, like, nodded my head. And she was like, do you mind if I sit, you know, with you guys? 
So I look, and I'm like, pointed to the middle seat, like, you want to sit here? And she was like, yeah. So I look at this lady, and I said, man, hell no, you can't sit here. I'm about <laughs> to go to sleep. Mm-mm, no. Now, that's what I said in my head. But out my mouth, I say, sure, go ahead and have a seat. I'm like, yo, my whole plan of a nap is about to be ruined now. So the lady sits down. So she comes to tell us that while she flies a lot, she doesn't like flying. You know, she has a, you know, not really like a fear per se, but just not really a fan of flying. And she absolutely hates the whole landing part, right? So we take off. And, you know, we be doing the, the small talk introductions, that whole nine. She goes on to tell us that she is on her way to go see her uncle who has died. So she's basically going to be with him for his, like, last days. And then she tells us it's not really her uncle. It's her husband's uncle. But her husband died two years ago. Mm. And... You know, um, she kind of starts getting sad as she's talking about her husband and, and his death and the whole lot. And so instantly, the two of us kind of go into priest mode. And so we're having this conversation about her and she's talking about her family. And then in the conversation, we start talking about how uh, basically she nurtures everybody else and, you know, Kind of nobody returns the favor, essentially, right? She doesn't spend enough time taking care of herself. And, you know, so we're talking to her. She gets emotional at several points throughout the conversation. And in the middle of this whole thing, I go back to my divination at that morning. And the first Odu that fell was Ofum, which is the giver. And then I start thinking like, oh, and then E.D., it's a nurturing energy. Um, and then, so I start thinking, ah, this is what my reading was about. It was about this situation. It wasn't about a delay or anything like that in regards to travel, but it was the patience and compromise, the giver, giving up my time and my energy right. for the betterment of somebody else, right? Mm -hmm. And so we had a beautiful conversation with this woman. And I know both of our spirits were said as a result of the conversation that we had. And so um, I didn't even have the need or feel the need to take a nap throughout the conversation. And so it was that where I was like, this is a beautiful start to our trip. Right, right. You know, you know, what was crazy about that whole interaction is before we even got on the plane, uh, because I remember when we went to Virginia, uh, we had a flight like that where it was kind of empty, you know, we was able to sit on our own row and all of those things. But I said something about that and you said, man, watch, it's going to be our luck. Some white lady I want to sit in between. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you I saying that. So when, she, so when she walked up there and said, can I sit in between y'all? I was like, look. <laughs> and then that was a uh, that was a flight attendant, a black lady, a flight attendant who just kept like she was she was kind of taken aback. She was kind of irritated that the white lady wanted to sit in between us. She was really irritated about that. Like she said so right. to us several times, like you know, there's a lot of different seats. If y'all want to get up and move, y'all can move. But uh, we was good, you know. Just in just in this moment, you talking about that uh, that interaction and me thinking about it. It made me think about how fragile human life is. Uh, her talking about her husband uh, dying two years prior, and now she's going to go and be with her husband's uncle for his last days. It made me think about how uh, fragile life is, but also about what Ifa says about death and how it is beneficial to us as a people. I know that sometimes comes off as a uh, abrasive, insensitive, or what have you, but it truly is. It's a, it's a, it's a way for us to get back home. What Ifi calls the spirit realm home. It's a way for us to get back home. 
uh, to rest before we have to do this all over again. So, yeah, it made me think about that. It made me think about uh, the chamber of reflection in, uh, in Freemasonry and how we're so always supposed to be thinking about the, the fragility of human life. So right. that's what that's what it really made me uh, made me think about how uh, we're supposed to be uh, priests and servants at all times. And for all people, so yeah, that was a beautiful start to our uh, to our trip, man. That was a beautiful start. Absolutely, you know, our Lua always says a priest job is never done. And never done. So you know, that was one of those things. Cause I'm telling you, I was I was out of there. I was ready. <laughs> I man, I had scooted down a little bit. I had my hood on. I was about to be out of there. And right before I got to that space, here she come, and I'm like. Oh, I know she ain't. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But I'm, I'm glad that I honored the energy. I'm glad we honored the energy. And, you know, it's, it's never a, a, a one sided thing, right? Whenever we have these interactions, you know, on one hand, it may seem like, oh, well, we gave up our time and energy and this, that, and the other. But man, the interaction was a blessing to us just as much as it was a blessing to her. And, you know, the way she hugged us, when we got off the plane and said, I chose the right two people to sit next to. Right. And so, you know, that made me feel great. That was a great way to start off the trip. Yeah, that was a beautiful um, thing. Yeah. And we learn, we learn also in those interactions. We learn about them. We also learn about ourselves, about how we uh, react in certain situations, you know, how we uh, are able to come up with the things that we came up with, talk to her about, uh, who she was, what she was going through, uh, talk to her about, uh, you know, what we were involved in. So, right. yeah, man, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful exchange. It was a beautiful interaction. Like I said, that was a beautiful start to our trip. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we get to Cuba. So we land in Cuba. What are your first impressions of Cuba? Um, my first impression is that it's a, it's a beautiful country. It's not as, uh, it's not as hot as I thought it was going to be. Uh, now, when we landed the plane, though, and had to get off the plane on the ground and walk to the uh, to the airport, <laughs> I was like, "Oh yeah, this small right here. This is this is uh, this is this is little. This is little." <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah. But my first impression was that it's a uh, it's a beautiful country. The people were beautiful. The people were friendly. Even though they knew that we couldn't speak uh, Spanish, they were uh, they were friendly. They were beautiful. And then we met a Babalawo uh, actually in the in the airport in Cuba, so that was another beautiful thing, a traditional Babalawo. So that was another beautiful thing. Who said that he goes back and forth to Cuba all the time? So yeah, so that was a beautiful thing. So immediately we met uh, somebody that practices in the faith. Uh, we saw uh, a lot of people with their days on. So yeah, we knew we were amongst uh, the culture. I knew immediately. Yeah, yeah, that was the thing when I first landed my first trip, you know, why, you know how we go through um, when we take get our picture taken and the whole nine, uh, when we're going through um, security, as soon as I, we go through that door, like that first time, somebody greeted me, you know, boy, oh boy, Abu Shisha, and I was like, oh yeah, I know I'm in good hands, you know what I'm saying, so you had a very similar experience going through. We met somebody immediately, you see all those days. you like, oh yeah, they're, they're on the same type of time we're on. Right. We're on the same type of time we're on. So one thing that I do want to stop and I want to talk about, because this is something that was surprising to me when I first went the first time. I remember asking people who had went, what did I need to do to get into Cuba? <laughs> and it seemed crazy. Like, it was, oh, you got to do this, you got to do that. Don't let them stamp your passport. You got to fly from Mexico, you know. You got to go from Mexico to Cuba or go to fly to Canada and go from Canada to Cuba. All these different things. Man, I've been to, what, 16 different countries. I've been out the country 20-some-odd times. The only difference and going to Cuba than going to any other country is the very first time I went, they asked me at the airport, what are you going to do? 
What are you going there for? And there's a list of, I think maybe like seven or nine different things you pick from. I said religious activities. They said, okay, that was that. That was the only difference. This time, they didn't even ask us that. You know? Right. Um, you can get the visa either online or you can wait till you get to, um, if you're flying out of Florida, you know, you'll get it, you know, pay for it there. Or if you have a layover in Florida, once you get to Florida, you can pay for it there in Florida. When I did it a couple of years ago, I paid for it in Florida. You had to pay cash. But this time I paid for hours um, online and they mailed it to the house. So super easy, super simple. Um, you know, you hear all these things about the embargo and the restrictions and us not being able to go over there. I went once during the, the Trump administration and once during the Biden administration. I had no problems whatsoever. So if you're interested in going to Cuba, I just wanted to make sure I, I say that up front. Go and don't be scared. It's not all these different things you do is just as simple as going anywhere else. Right. Okay. <clears throat> so we get to Cuba. Um, check in and everything was smooth. You know, we, we kind of um, went around our neighborhood and walked around, got some food and things of that nature. And then, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. You skipping, you skipping, you skipping over some things now. <laughs> he say, he said we walked around and got some food. No, 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 no. We <laughs> what we did was is we got lost two times. We got lost two times looking for the same spot. I promise you, we walked around for probably 45 minutes to realize that the spot was about five minutes from where we were staying at. Now, keep in mind that I'm in a country with my brother, a person who's all he's already been there, so I'm following his lead. And so I'm going where he say go. Uh, you know, we can, we've been here before. He's been here before. <laughs> so we walking around. He like, nah, this ain't the way. Turn back around, go the other way. We done passed up our spot again. He's like, nah, this ain't the way. So long story short, we in, we get lost two times on the first night. We walk about 45 minutes uh, to go to a spot that was like 10 minutes from the spot. Then I think we did the same thing the next day, too. Uh, we did the exact same thing, walked around for like 30 minutes trying to find the same spot. I'm like, my four eight, come on, man. You got me, you got me in a uh, in a foreign country that you didn't already been to and we don't know where we're going. <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> so in my defense, let me throw this out there too. There are certain because of the embargo, there are certain apps that don't work in Cuba. Like for instance, you cannot get on TikTok right. while you're in Cuba. Also, Google Maps. Google Maps doesn't work. Like you can, it'll do the preview thing, but I, I just, even with the preview thing on Google Maps, I still think it's off, right? But you can't like, you know, put in something, hit start, and it'll show you whether you're driving or walking. That doesn't work. I've used Google Maps all around the world, it does not work whatsoever. And, you know, I'm not a map reader. That that was never my uh, claim to fame. <laughs> now, Oshayun reads maps on a regular basis. But when he was trying to use Google Maps, he had us messed up too. Then he had to go into maps, and then that worked a lot better in getting yeah. us where we needed to go directionally. But yeah, we went to a restaurant that I went to several times the first time, and I knew we were staying in the same neighborhood, so I knew it was like right there. But yeah, it, it, it did take us 45 minutes. I will say, <laughs> you can't get lost twice to go to, to one place. It's right. all one, it's just lost once. <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll we were go with that. super lost that one time. We'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> I feel like I feel like you said a whole lot to say that I eventually got us to the spot where we was trying to go to. Somebody that had never been to Cuba before, I was the one that eventually found what, yeah. found what we needed to find on the phone, get to the right maps, figure out where we're going, and 
got us to our spot, man. So yeah, I was I I saved the day. I saved the day. It definitely the first the first night in Cuba for sure. Absolutely. So uh, just FYI, don't use Google Maps if you go to, to to Cuba. If you're trying to directionally figure out where you're going, the area that we were in is very walkable, right? Very walkable. Mm-hmm. So just use Google Maps to kind of get you yourself situated. You know, we walked on average about seven miles a day for six mm-hmm. days. So yeah. um, the area we were in were very walkable, right? We would just go to a location and then we was we were good from there. We would we would figure it out. Um, so we wake up that Sunday, right? And it's time to go on our first excursion. What did we do Sunday? What was the first Man, thing? I, I want to say. Uh... Cause that wasn't our Beyond Roots or the. Uh, yeah, our, uh, I think that was Beyond Roots. That was, it was Beyond yeah. Roots. The, the That's first Beyond day. Beyond Roots. That was a That's beautiful. What we did. Day. That was yeah. that was that was beautiful. Um, because we got to first uh, shout out Frank. Frank, he he really looked at, and I'm horrible with names, so it's a it's a, <laughs> it's a miracle I remember his name. But yeah, shout out to Frank, man, because he could. He can speak English. He walked us. He walked us around, man. We went and looked at some really beautiful things. He took us to a neighborhood called Guanabacoa, uh, where the uh, the secret society of the Abuqua, uh was present. They had a lodge there. He took us to a, a, a Babalawo's home. We went there, got cleansed, talked to a Babalawo through him, of course, because the Babalawo only spoke uh, Spanish. But it was a beautiful thing to talk to a a, a brother Awo. Uh, we got a chance to really come to the understanding that we are more similar than we are different. Uh, we talk about a lot of the same things, believe a lot of the same things. Uh, the cosmologies are very, very, very similar, if not the same. Uh, the philosophy, very, very similar, if not the same. So we have a lot more similarities than we do uh, differences. We went into their shop. We bought some things out of their uh, out of their shop. There's some young ladies in there that do hair, that do uh, things for uh, women's uh, faces. And, you know, so we bought some stuff for uh, for my wife, for uh, for my daughter, for my son. So yeah, man, we bought a, a lot of things in there and we had a beautiful time, man. We spent all day with Frank. I think the best part about that though, was uh, we call her auntie now, man. What she cooked was, mm-hmm. was slammy, man. Them fritters, whatever that was, was on point. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, as a part of the excursion, we had a home cooked meal. It was all vegan. So, you know, when you go to these, you know, the islands, when you go to like South America, I mean, they're not eating meat all day, every day. You know, right. um, meat is expensive for one. So, you know, you don't have a problem if you're vegetarian or, or vegan being able to go into a majority of the restaurants and find something to eat. But auntie laid it out, though. I mean, we had a full spread. Uh, I don't even yeah. eat okra, for real. Like, you know, um, I might lose my black card, but I don't even do fry okra, <laughs> for real. Like, I just don't. It don't really taste like nothing, for real, like that to me. And uh, auntie made some okra, slapping. Right. So, yeah, yeah. We had some kind of, like, a rice with, like, vegetables in it we had we had okra we had the fritters we had potatoes um yeah some type of ham yeah man it was it was probably the one of the best it was definitely one of the best things that we had the the two best things we had was both home cooked meals so oh yeah for sure yeah that was great and that juice she made that uh that agave juice yeah guava Guava. Yeah, it was guava. Yeah, guava. yeah, man, yeah that was yeah. that was good, man. That was real good. Yeah, yeah. She looked yeah. out for us. And she she was actually in her um in her year in white. Uh, yeah, she was yeah. a, a Yawo. Uh, so she was in her year in white. So and we saw that a lot uh, throughout Cuba. We saw a lot of people uh, that were still in the midst of their uh, year in white. You know, we don't do that uh, here. Not that I know of. Not not as traditional. Uh, or what we call traditional practitioners, we don't do the year in white. I haven't done the year in white. I haven't seen anybody doing year in white. Um, now, I've seen people get initiated into Obatala and have to do a certain amount of time in white, but 
not just coming into the tradition or just getting uh, initiated into any of the Orishas going into the uh, year in white. So that was a beautiful thing to see. That's a that's a very strenuous uh, year for them because they are considered babies. They wear all white. Um, I've heard some of them say that they don't sit at the table to eat. Uh, I've heard them say that um, they are not supposed to look at their reflection, uh, reflections in the mirror. Yeah. Um, so it's a very strenuous uh, one year and seven days from what I hear uh, for them. So that's a beautiful thing. It, it really takes discipline. So yeah, shout yeah. out to them. They can't that. hand anything to anybody either. Right. You know, um, yeah. that's another thing they can't do. Also, one of the things that I found out, even though it's so much a part of the culture, you would see Iyawos from children to like, you know, like say auntie was, we call her auntie because she was old enough to be our auntie, you know what I'm saying? Or our mm -hmm. mother, you know, she was, she was a, a, an older woman. But because there are so many afro cuban um, Afro-Cuban, I don't know why I said Cuban like I was from Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> so many Afro-Cuban uh, religions down there where, you know, they may practice multiple different things. So, you know, it may be once they get older in life that they may be then become Yahweh. So, man, that's, so that was another thing. Um, and then we learned, like, what you say, how you greet them. So we was doing that all for the rest of the week right. after that. Um, so you right. see somebody, you know, you go, Santo. And then I don't even know what they say back. You know what I'm saying? Because they give you they like say, a sentence back. They say thank, they say uh, blessings. It's like benedicions, benediciones, something like that. Oh, I haven't said They said that. something like a few words. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, once we learn that. But oh, another thing too with the Beyond Roots though is that we got a, a, a performance. You know, there was a drumming. You know, mm -hmm. so we got to, to witness that they did songs to uh, several of the Orisha. Right. The only one I remember for sure, for sure, off the top of my head, was of course the King Sean Roman. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah. So, um, but they that did, was they dope, did songs though. to most of the major. Uh, Orisha, I heard, I heard Orumila, I heard uh, Oshun, I heard Yemuja, mm -hmm. Shango, Ogun. So yeah, it was a, it was a beautiful drum, and we had a, a beautiful time. The the Babalawo came back and saw us again, gave us a gift, gave us both uh, Obatala uh, Eleke. So yeah. yeah, man, it was a beautiful, it was a beautiful thing. We had, that was a beautiful experience with Beyond Roots. So if you plan on going to Cuba. Man, check out Beyond Roots, man. It's a beautiful thing that they're doing there uh, in Cuba. Hopefully, we can do some type of uh, link on this video because they're doing a crowdfunding campaign. So, oh, absolutely. If you, if you feel compelled, uh, you know, support support those brothers and sisters out there in uh, in Cuba. They're doing a beautiful thing, making an attempt to bring the culture uh, to people. Uh, who don't necessarily practice the tradition in Cuba, but they are also trying to get it worldwide. So, yeah, we hope to be able to help them in some way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the other things that um, was just kind of really dope about that experience. Oh, so when we were talking to Frank, one of the things that, that came out as well, this is just another thing that came to my mind, was the experiences of living in Cuba and how they operate as a communist country. Our tour guide was a lawyer by trade. So what you're going to see is, I know when we go to a lot of these different countries and people are coming and they're asking for money and things of that nature, it's easy as Americans or probably Europeans or Canadians or whatever to kind of pass judgment on these people. But a lot of these people that you will run into in Cuba are actually highly educated. Mm -hmm. But like I said, Frank was, was a lawyer by trade and he just got to a point where he can make more money being a tour guide. So he left, you know, being a lawyer. 
and you, you, you can't have a private practice, right? You all work for the government. So like, for instance, doctors make between 12 to $15 US per month. That is their salary. You can't have a private practice. You have to work for the government. You know, um, one of our other tour guides that, well, kind of more of a friend of mine that I met the first time around. And so I got with him again. He came and he hung out, spent a day with us later on in the trip. But he went to school for engineer, for like chemical engineer. So these people are highly educated. It's mm -hmm. just the system they live in. Um, they get free education. They get um, free like um, health care, like free housing. But food is, is expensive and inflation is through the roof there now. But like I said, people like doctors, lawyers, they get 12 to 15 dollars US. So, you know, we got to really dig into how things were going in Cuba and, and really had a lot of conversations throughout the whole week we were there about the conditions of Cuba and the people and what they have to deal with. And, their living conditions. So, and they can't really, it's hard for them to leave the country too. They can't just book a ticket and even a visit and go to other countries. So yeah, it's, it's, um, it's a lot going on with the Cuban people. Right, that was, that was, that was one of the most disheartening things was to uh, find out about um, the government that they're under and the, the perils that they're suffering because of it. I know uh, yeah. politics can be a, a divisive subject, but this is, for, at least in my opinion, this is the exact type of government that I believe will be here in the United States of America if we continue to go down the path that we're going right now. It will be the exact same government. The government will be large. The government will be will start to oversee everything. You hear a lot of people asking about this uh, universal income. That's basically what Cuba is doing now, a universal income where everybody, food is money, food is money. So if the government doesn't give you money and decides to give you food, that's a universal income. And that's what we are asking for over here. Seemingly, that's what we are asking for. I don't think that when people like us go and visit these types of countries like Cuba, like these communist countries, socialist countries, whatever term you want to give it. I don't think we really realize uh, because we're not focused on the government while we're over there. We're focused on the culture. We're focused on the people and not really paying attention to the government. But the government runs everything. Like you say, that there's no you can't be a doctor and have a private practice. One of the waitresses that we had, she's a doctor, but to supplement her income, she's a waitress on the side. You would never have to do that as a doctor here in America. You would never have to do that. Um, it's it's just, it's crazy. And like you said, the inflation is so high that at the government level, one US dollar is like 120 Cuban pesos. But if you exchange it on the street, you're getting like 350 Cuban pesos. So the inflation is crazy out there. Uh, food is very expensive out there. And that's what, that's what we are... Uh, looking down the barrel of right now in the United States, if we continue to ask for the government to continue to step in, we need the government to do this, we need the government to do that, we need the government to over oversee this program and oversee that program. We, I don't, I don't, I, for me, I really don't understand the allure of having the government run everything. It's like what we are asking for has not worked anywhere else. It doesn't, it doesn't work. They have they have free health care. You can get your PhD over there for free. But when you get done with that PhD, there is nothing for you to do with it to make you even remotely successful. So or what we would consider successful. It's, there's nothing for you to do with that. So that's something to think about, man. We do not want communism or socialism in the United States of America. My plan is to eventually actually go to Sierra Leone get my citizenship over there because Sierra Leone is one of the countries that if you have gotten your uh, DNA results through African ancestry, you can actually apply for and get 
citizenship in Sierra Leone. I plan on doing that. So when it hits the fan over here, me, my family, we got we got somewhere to go. When when the communism and socialism starts over here, we got somewhere to go, man. I'll show you. I'll show you. The next day we did the tour in the, in the old school with Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did a tour of, oh, yeah. of, of of Havana, you know. And uh that was that was cool. We got to see all all the sites. Uh, for me, the most memorable part of that is we went to uh, I think they call it Havana Forest. That's where they go. I call it Elbow Forest, mm-hmm. where pretty much they go do all the elbows out there, right. which is animal sacrifice. But one thing that I did differently this time. So when I went last time, we we pulled up in the parking lot of Havana Forest. We got out and we walked around. My niece and I. This time we like drove through it. And when we drove through it, I got to see parts of it that I never saw before. Man, when I tell you driving through this place was like watching um, Avatar. Mm -hmm. It was gorgeous. Like Mm -hmm. it was beyond gorgeous. the what's the the saber tree looks like the tree where you just take your locks and then you connect in like oh my god it was gorgeous absolutely was. gorgeous yeah it was it was it looked it looked like a uh like a tropical heaven man that, that's how it mm-hmm. that's how it really looked you know there were there were parts of our trip where we were able to get above the the canopy of the trees and you can actually look down on the trees and see how uh, how beautiful that that it looks like a tropical forest and that's how uh, that's how beautiful it was. But yeah, man, that was a we took a lot of pictures, a lot of video. I think I took more pictures in Cuba than I've taken in my life. <laughs> right, you kept saying that. I'm you said that like, day two. <laughs> like, like I've never taken this many pictures in my life. Because I don't I don't I don't really take pictures like that. And yeah, man, that was a uh, that was a beautiful thing, man. It was sunny the whole time. No clouds in the sky. Yeah, it was uh it was beautiful. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Beautiful. It was beautiful. So the next day we got with our guy Rona. Man. And he probably tired of me now. He probably tired of me already. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Right. You I know you've been hitting him up daily. Man, daily. Rona um it was our tour guide, and this was something, an experience that we got off of Airbnb. And Rona practices Abuqua. He practices uh, Palo Mayombe, and he is in his Iawo, his year white, uh, Ray La Deocha, or Lukumi. And so, very, very knowledgeable. I think he started at 18 in Abuqua. Yeah, I think he did. I think he said he started at 18 in Abuqua and as a very young uh, young man in, uh, in Regla de Ocha and uh, Palo Mayombe. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, Abuqua is one of those, it, it's, they call it a secret society. It's a society of men, or um, only you have to be a man to, to be a part of this. And it comes out of Nigeria. It's one of those traditions that was preserved in Cuba. You don't hear of that here in the States, Mm -hmm. Um, but they have it in Cuba. And it's it's one of the things you don't know a lot about. Like I said, it it is a quote unquote secret society, but it's a, it's a very spiritual organization. Uh, Like I said, it comes out of Nigeria. So I would probably say it has a lot of probably, you know, very similar um, things. I remember when we would go, when we went to the museum as a part of the tour and there's a room dedicated to Abuqua, like where, you know, it's, it, there's a cord is roped off, you know, and they have their own room. And interesting enough though, one of the, the um, figures of Abuqua resembles something that I saw and I actually bought one, a doll from an Indian tribe out of New Mexico. Mm. So just kind of how those things are, you know, 
these indigenous practices are very interconnected. Right. So, um, man, yeah, we learned a lot. We went to a museum and, you know, he took us through the museum, all the Afro-Cuban religions or spiritual traditions, you know, were um, highlighted in his museum. And I said, he shared a lot of information. He's like a, a chief in Abaqua, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I said, Paulo Mayambe right after that. And like I said, he's in his year in white. So he's a, um, a priest in the uh, Lukumi tradition. And mm -hmm. so that was, that was dope. That was dope. And it was me and you. And then there was one other person, um, a woman out of Dallas, who was a Christian, but who was just interested to understand the culture and the, mm -hmm. the traditions there. And so she came, she was on a solo trip and she thoroughly enjoyed it. Right. She did. Yeah, I learned, I've learned more about the, the Abaqua since I've been back home. I know now that the Abaqua didn't just come out of Nigeria, they came out of a place called the Cross River region where uh, Nigeria and Cameroon borders so there were Nigerians and Cameroonians that created this society called the Ekpe, uh, which means leopard, the leopard society. And it was that that crossed the Atlantic and made it into uh, to Cuba and became the Abuqua. So I've learned that. And I've talked to Rona more about it. So I've asked him about the Abuqua. Uh, is it a prerequisite for you to be a Cuban to be in the Abuqua? He said, yes. Um, I've, I've talked to him mostly about uh, Paulo Mayombe and the Rama or the lineage that he's um, a part of. And yeah, man, so I've been talking to him a lot about uh, Paulo, a lot about uh, learning Spanish. Like going to Cuba really, really makes me want to buckle down and learn Spanish. It really does make me want to buckle down and learn Spanish. I, uh, since I've been home, I've downloaded Duolingo been doing my little uh, <laughs> been doing my little uh Spanish Spanish exercises and you know yeah man I really do I really do want to learn I bought some Spanish books while I was out there you know Fafori was hating on me too man because I bought some, I, some Spanish that books hilarious. <laughs> that I, was I bought, hilarious. Bought some Spanish books see you know the problem is you know how sometimes you know somebody just as well as they know themselves and then the, the difference is because you're not them. Like when they start lying to themselves, then you have to tell them like, no, you're lying to yourself. <laughs> like he tried to convince me. He doesn't like, and I'm the same way. Reading something like a PDF off a tablet, I used to do that, you know? And I, at one point I read the majority of my books off a of Kindle, like the Kindle app mm -hmm. on my cell phone. You know, like I was going crazy reading. Every time I had a, a spare moment, every time I went to the bathroom, I'm pulling out, let me read a chapter or something. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, at some point where I just got this thing where I'm like, man, I got to have the actual book in my hand, right? Mm -hmm. And he's the same way. Well, he tried to, <laughs> so he tried <laughs> to convince me that he was going to take one of these Spanish books and there's a pen he said that you can get that, yeah. that translates it. I'm like, dude, you're not going to do that. You might buy the pen, right? Like you might convince yourself to where you buy the pen, but you're not going to do that though. You're going to, after about a couple of pages, you're going to be like, nah, I can't do this. So I'm watching him lie to himself about, oh, I'm about to buy a new book in Spanish <laughs> and then I'm going to read it like this. And I'm like, no, you're not. No, no, for real, man, you hate it. I'm good. No, you're not. No, you're yeah. not. So um, we're going to update y'all about you know how he does with this book and this oh, I'm probably thing. definitely I'm probably definitely not gonna do that. <laughs> see, see, look, but <laughs> but my plan is to eventually learn Spanish and read it like that because I can I can definitely read more Spanish than I can understand because I can make out a lot of the words and kind of get the uh get the gist of it. But one of the, one of those books I haven't even taken out of the plastic because I know that at some point it's gonna be worth something so i'm gonna keep oh, it that's gonna that be... too, you hit me with. <laughs> <laughs> it is it is lydia lydia cabrera and her book el monte is called the bible of santeria 
And it's called that for a reason. Like she supposedly goes really in depth, but she has an English version of it though. She has an English version of uh, El Monte that I had planned on getting, saw the Spanish version while I was in Cuba and got and, uh, and got that. Uh, the book that I have on the Abuqua, the sacred language of the Abuqua was written by her in Spanish, but it's, it's been translated into English. So I got that, uh, that too book on Paulo Mayombe since I've been back. But I really do, man. Going to going to Cuba has made me want to uh really learn Spanish. I plan on going to uh Puerto Rico next year with my wife and my kids. So man, I want to learn Spanish, man. I really do want to learn Spanish. Yeah, I probably should learn Spanish. I've been to so many Spanish speaking countries, but cause my internet works so well. <laughs> I mean I'm I hit you with some hood Spanish though. Like, yeah. you, know, you, you will somewhat know what I'm talking about. Like, you know, I, I had to pull that out. So that was cool. <laughs> um, yeah. So then after that, the, the next day after that probably was the highlight. Um, well, I don't know. It, it was so many highlights. It's hard for me to say something was the highlight. But it was the longest excursion because we had to drive two and a half hours each way to get there. We went to Vinales, and in mm. Vinales, that's where you get the, the the cigars. That's where they um, produce a lot of coffee, and it's country, right? Which I want to tell you this: if you travel out of the country, try to make a habit of not just spending all of your time in the cities or the mm -hmm. major cities of these different places, man. The more times I go out the country and go outside of the city, oh man, it's amazing. Vinales, just go the way down there, and once we got down there, it was absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I recommend that. I don't care where you go, start going and venturing out outside of the, the major cities. Uh, we took this tour. It was about 10 of us on the, on the tour. <laughs> hey, but here's a funny story about that, right? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, so, look, so, I'm communicating. So, I, I set everything up. I'm communicating with all the different people, right? So, the guy sent me a picture of the guy who is, I guess owns the, the company, right? And he sends me a picture of the guy that we're going to meet. Got it. So we run it a little late, right? And so O'Shea okay, wasn't gonna say we was late every day, but his we, were. we got a different my whole thing is I always say <laughs> I'm like God, I might not be there when you want me to, but I'm gonna be right on time. <laughs> so I, if you say be there at seven is gonna start at seven. If I get there, no matter what time I get there, if I get there and they started yet, then I'm on time. Right. I don't care if I get there at eight o'clock, if it ain't start till 18, I'm on time. If you right. start at seven, I don't get there to 10 30. And you ain't started yet, I'm on time. Right. So I'm like, look, we got this. Plus things don't move too quickly in Cuba, like you know, a lot of other um not only African, but, you know, Latin American countries. So I'm like, we cool, we got this. But on this day, I'm like, ooh, okay, like, I ain't say nothing to him, but I'm like, okay, yeah, we, we got to hurry and get downstairs, right? So we get downstairs, a guy approaches us. Then y'all left? Yeah. Come on. So we get in the car, I'm like, oh, we about to ride a bucket all the way to Then y'all Again, it's two and a half hours each way, right? So we get in the car. Dude pulls off. Now he driving Miss Daisy because he texting at the same time that he on the phone. Now we ain't in no, no danger because it, it really ain't no traffic out there in Cuba, right? So we bust the corner and then he starts going real slow. And then he like stops in the middle of the street and looks back at us and says something like, then y'all I'm like, yeah. And then I think, and he asked my name, and I told him, and then he shows me the phone. 
man, we <laughs> he he mentioned two women's names. I'm like, nah. <laughs> so we didn't got into the wrong whip. So we had to circle the block. I'm like, nah, you gotta take us back. Cause now I'm real like, uh oh, we about to get left. You gotta take us back, dude. So he circled the block, dropped us off. It's two women. That was down there when we got down there that was waiting. But he approached us and said, Vinales. I'm like, yeah, we going to Vinales. Right. So when I pulled up the thing, I'm like, oh, that definitely ain't him. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so let's back up a little bit though. Let's back up a little bit because it seems like you try to avoid telling the people that this like the third or fourth time you didn't had us just just out there butt naked like we didn't we didn't hopped in the in the uh, in the car with the wrong dude like well <laughs> and then Jimmy got Fafore got the picture of the dude in his phone and we still got in the wrong car man we still but got in the wrong that was like the I third or fourth look at the time picture. Out of here. Dude approached <laughs> us and was like, Vinales. I'm like, yeah. So this got to be him, right? Right. Man, it don't look nothing like dude. So we pulled up. Um, again, we was on time because dude wasn't there yet. So then they they called me like, hey, you know, what street is it on again? And I told them. So then they got and they came and picked us up. So we was in like a, not a van. Not, I guess, a, a bus type of thing, but not like a bus. I don't know, some kind of a shuttle situation. Yeah, I'll call it that, some kind of a shuttle. So we was 10 deep, and uh, we went to Vinales. Um, beautiful trip. It was some Americans on there. It was some Canadians on there as well. Um, so we had, a, we, had, <laughs> we had a good time. So as a part of the trip, you could either, there's a, there's a, a space where you could either walk, uh, ride a horse, or you can, like, you know, be pulled by an ox, right? Even though Oshayun is born and raised in in Texas, he don't do, he don't play the whole horse. He's been on the horse more. I've been on the horse more than him, and I'm from Ohio, so from he's like, though. nah. <laughs> but still, in the hood, I didn't see in the third world, where you from, I didn't see dudes with some J's, a, a, a grocery bag, and a horse. <laughs> Matter That's of fact, new, man. every time I have seen a horse in Houston, it's been where you, it's been in your neighborhood. Where you- Hey, from. you know, that's new. But we know we know about the dudes that ride the horses, they be from Acres Home. So it's all, I've always known about dudes from Acres Home, from Homestead, they, they been riding horses, but. Wow, the friend. projects, mind you, that he just named, and they got horses. And we, but not in third ward though. We, we ain't riding no horses. <laughs> not when I was coming up. So I knew yeah. I didn't want to get on no horse. But now looking back though, I I would have rather rode a horse than been on that cart though. So we got an ox joint, right? So this is in my mind where the ox joint is. You know how you have the horse and carriage? Just take the horse out and put the ox. That's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, we could do that. You know what I'm saying? Cool. Man, when we get there, it's like, you know the old school, I'm talking about like medieval, like the, the, <laughs> the chariots where you stand up. We had, we was pulled in a chariot. Right. Right. And we being pulled on a trail that ain't even really set up for walking, let alone uh no no chariot pulled by no ox. Right. So and at least the chariots that I done seen, at least in the movies, right? They look good and sturdy. This is like a chariot where they just took some planks of wood and nailed it in. One handle was like a plank of wood, the other one looked like a tree branch. <laughs> and it has some give to it too. So I'm like, ooh. Right. So it's, it's me and uh, this older black lady. We and one together. And um, Oshayun with, with uh, two other people. They was American, right? Or they was Canadian? No, they was American. They were American. Okay. So he with two other American. Man, me and my lady, we in there. We having to coach each other through it. Like, we like, go to the left. 
because <laughs> it gets to like it's about to tip over. All right, go to the uh, right. Like, man, it's crazy, right? So we do that. Um, and then we we took that at, at some point. We we had, we like we take a, a walk to this house, and from the house we get on the carts and the horses, and it was like one person walking, and then we go to to the farm where they're making the cigars and stuff like that. And everybody had a little weed in the cigar because the way some of these people was acting <laughs> with the cigars, <laughs> right? Like, either they put a little weed in it or they put a little something, they put a little powder in the sun because some of them was acting good. I said, come on, off a cigar. Right. Um, but yeah, it was dope, man. That was dope. And then we went to a cave and we mm. walked through the cave. You know, I was yeah. proud of you for walking through the cave too. I appreciate that too, man. I appreciate that. So I really, I really want to put that picture <laughs> up to for, for people to know I did that because under normal circumstances, nah, you couldn't have taught me to walk into that cave because the just because of the terrain though, like the like this wasn't no to me, it wasn't a regular cave. This was a cave that was made because. The rocks fell. Like, it was just rocks everywhere. <laughs> it's like, hey, how do you know this won't happen again? Like, the, how do you know these rocks won't fall again? I'm talking about there's rocks everywhere, man. I'm talking about I'm having to turn my flashlight on, try to use one hand to step over all of these. But we walked, we walked all the way there. But the most, even though we saw some um, fossilized uh, amoeba and those type of things. For me, the most amazing thing that I saw inside the cave was this hose that uh, that Renee mm -hmm. had put in that cave for his wife that ran from the top of the mountain all the way down to their house because it was believed that that water was holy water. And she said that that was the only way that she would marry him was if he actually ran a hose from the top of the mountain down to that house so that she could have some of that holy water every day. This is not a tall tale. This is not a this is not a myth. This is something that we actually went inside the cave and saw with our own two eyes. He actually has a hose ran down from the top of the mountain all the way down to their home so that they could uh have some of that holy water. We drunk some and I mean it tastes like water from the gods. It tastes like it tastes like water from the heavens, man, for real. So, yeah. So I think I think we're healthy uh, because of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's stories about people having illnesses and drinking that water and mm -hmm. pouring the water on their head and becoming healed. Um, right. And, and again, man, it, it probably was about two miles um, where he had it running. This ain't like you know those of us who grew up in the inner city. This ain't like running an extension cord. From your next door neighbor because your mama didn't pay the utility bill. This ain't that. Right. I mean, like, like, I mean, he put in some work work for this. Real work. So, yeah, man. And they had a beautiful farm, man. Mm -hmm. You know, and they cooked. They cooked for it, man. Um, his wife cooked for 10 people. 10 people. Um, and I mean, it was a nice spread. It was a couple of people who said, like, the chicken they had was the best chicken. They had ever had um mm -hmm. but it was like they had beans and rice like black beans and rice mixed together and then they had like this black bean soup and then white rice they had sweet potatoes they had like yucca um they had like um what kind of chips were those they had Damn, I don't, they actually I don't, had some I think they homemade were chips yeah okay yeah, it was man. good, man. It was it was fantastic. And then we had the water, and then they made some kind of like a um, it looked like baby food, like um, a mango puree mm -hmm. from mangoes that grew there, you know, um, at the farm. And that it was, was good. good. Yeah, man. That, it looked like man, baby food. Sweet potatoes. That sweet potatoes don't look like ours. Yeah, they're white. They're white. Yeah. Oh, and they they yeah. are amazing too. I'm talking about those are those are some that the yucca. I had never eat, uh, eaten that before. That was really 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 good. I don't know what she did to the beans and rice, but I mean, yeah. 
I mean, we did some we did some real good eating. Those those two home cooked meals we got, that was some that was some real good eating right there, man. Some real good eating. Yeah, yeah. But man, yeah. they sat on a they sat on a beautiful piece of land. And here's another thing too. The with all the farmers, the uh, the Cuban government gets ninety percent of the crop, mm -hmm. and then you get to keep. And they pay you for 90% of the crop. And it's not like they pay you, like they come, they pick up the whatever it is, you know, whether it's uh, coffee or whether it's um, the uh, tobacco. Uh, tobacco or whatever. And then they're like, all right, we got this. Here we go, your paper. No, they mail you a check. You get a check. And I think they said they had got their, the last shit came seven months after the fact. Seven months, man. And then they have to go, they get a check. They got to go two hours, two, two and a half hours into Havana to cash it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, Renee, Renee was salty. Renee was the husband. And, right. and he was salty, <laughs> you know. Um, they were yeah. an older couple. Yeah, Renee was heated, but they get 10% of the product and mm -hmm. they could do whatever they want to the thing about it too is is that you can't like market yourself right so you can't come up with a dope label and say man this is this is that that Oshayun fire blend you know what i'm saying you can't do that like mm -hmm. you know you just it's here regular and then there's restrictions on being able to sell it like you can't just you know even bust up at the market like boom I got them pre roll like it don't right. work out like that, you know. So right. it's it's hard to make money, man. You know what I'm saying? So they get mm -hmm. a lot from non American tours because there's there's still some information that we don't really know what you can and cannot take back to the U.S. Um, you bought with like five, and you was able to bring them back. Yeah, I got them back. Yeah, I bought I bought some um, some of their uh, cigars. Yeah, yeah, I didn't. I didn't want them that problem because, and plus I don't smoke anyway. But I did give me one pre roll though. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah, yeah, that's, that could be good. That's good for SU. Yeah, that's good. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's what I'm. That's what I'm gonna use mine for. But I think I think that was the most one of the most disheartening things that I heard about. Um, you know, all of the work that they go through. Uh, planting and harvesting the crops that they have the tobacco and the uh and the coffee them having to sell 90 percent of it to the government and then not being able to compete with the government and selling the 10 percent that they do have left like you said they can't just go to the market and sell their own coffee or their own tobacco because now you are competing with the government and when you actually get on the farm and see how hard it is for them to pick coffee like me just watching them explain because i'm in love with coffee and me just watching them explain how difficult it is for them to uh pick coffee uh man for them to have to give up 90 percent of it to be paid whatever the government says that is worth for you to keep 10 percent of it and not be able to sell it in the market uh people have to come two and a half hours to you to come and get it, to buy it directly from your farm. I believe the government understands that people are not doing that. Our whole trip from Havana to Vinales, you see people that are trying to go in between the two and everybody's hitchhiking. Everybody's hitchhiking. Yeah. Everybody's trying to uh, wave down cabs and buses and things like that because there is absolutely nothing in between Havana and Vinales. Once you are in between the two, you are stuck. There are no street lights out there. I don't. I don't understand how those people do it and how they're getting back and forth between the two. Because once uh, the sun sets, I mean, there is no light out there. There's no light out there at all. But uh, yeah, Renee, he he didn't want to talk about it anymore. Uh, <laughs> right. They were. They were. Uh, him and him and Pepe though. They seemed like a. They they were a very beautiful couple. They still seemed uh, happy. They had their land. Uh, Renee said that the land had been in his his family for five generations, so he still had that land. So, 
I guess they were uh, they were happy with that. That cave was on their land. Uh, those oxen were on their land. The horses. Mm-hmm. They had animals just running around. They had they had pigs. They had chickens. They had uh, goats. So they had they had everything. Oh, it's also illegal for you to kill your own cow because you can't you can't kill your own cow and eat its your own beef. It's illegal in the country of Cuba. You cannot kill a cow and eat that beef or sell it. That's that's crazy to me. Yeah, man. So it, it's a it's a lot of restrictions out there, you know. But it's an extremely safe country. No no guns, no knives, no kind of weapons. Um, you have a joint, you know what I'm saying, out there. That's like five years. Mm-hmm. You know they don't play around with drugs. You know, so you know you can walk around women. You know, you can take a solo trip and, and feel comfortable. Like I said, we hung out with um, the lady from, from Dallas. We went to go to eat lunch, you know, the three of us after, you know, an excursion that we had. And, you know, she said she felt completely safe and the whole nine. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the government owns a lot of the hotels, so you got to stay in an Airbnb. Right. Or find a private hotel. The young lady that we were talking about from Dallas, she had a um, private hotel she stayed at. The man, the, the parts of Cuba looked like it was a, invaded by aliens. And what I mean by that is you got big, huge, beautiful mansions um, that are kind of run down. And what happened mm-hmm. was you had the rich people when Castro took over, they did. They were like, hey, look, they told their servants, hey, just keep it up, keep it nice. You know, we'll be back in about a year. And they never came back. And so the government either allowed, like, the servants to keep the property, but again, they don't have the money for the upkeep. So now we're talking, what, 64, 65 years later, it's just, they're just run down. Or a lot of the really big and nice ones, the government took those over and now they're embassies, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, so yeah, that that's Cuba. Um, so, other than that, we we went to the beach. We spent the day at the beach, and the beach is absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. When I went in 2022, the beach was empty. Um, there wasn't really any restaurants really doing much around there or anything like that it kind of was like a dead area i was trying to find water my tour guide was taking me from place to place man we had to go far walk far out before we could get one bottle of water maybe they let us have two um and that was 2022 they were still trying to recover from covid and they still haven't recovered from covid but um, but when we went this time, the beach was popping. It was packed. I'm talking about beautiful beach, beautiful blue water, um, man, clean, the whole nine. It was, I mean, when I talk about the beach was packed, I'm talking about it was packed. I could have took 10 machine guns last time and shot them all off and killed two people <laughs> when I was there last time. This time it was popping. So, you know, that was though. You know, I get in the water swim. Oshayun ain't the one for um, the swimming or whatever. Mm-hmm. But we would be remiss if we did not talk about the savior of the trip. Because mm-hmm. Oshayun was, he had laser focus. It didn't matter what we experienced, and what we did over there. The trip would have been a total disaster. If he did not find some uh, EFA or, well, I'll just say EFA, we, we use the same stuff, right? Some, some religious souvenirs or items to take back. It would have been a trash trip for him. I don't right. care all the beautiful, amazing things that we did. You know, you heard us talk about it. It would have been terrible if we didn't find that. And so one day, we are like really, really focus on that and we're kind of walking away from the action because when I was there before there was a market 
that was going on like outside. And I knew from research it was on the weekend, but a guy told me, oh, no, that's every day. So we're walking, I'm like, man, ain't nobody out here. This ain't, well, as far as people, vendors and people selling, they got like a dope painting. Like they had paintings and all kinds of stuff just outside, right? And so we're walking that way. And we're walking, walking, walking. I said, man, I knew I wasn't tripping. I knew it was just on the weekend. So we get to the end and we turn around to go back towards like the, the middle of uh, Old Havana. And so we're walking back and this Cuban woman walks, runs up on us. Hey guy, what are you doing? I'm, I'm doing tours, blah, blah, blah. I work for tips, whatever you want to give me, you know, doesn't matter. You know, I've been out here two weeks. I ain't had a tour in two weeks. Whatever you want me to do, I'll take you. You can just tip me whatever. And so at first we was like, no, nah, we cool. But then I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. I was like, look, hey, we trying to get some like religious items, yada, 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 where can we go? I could take you there. All right, let's go. So Stephanie, shout out to Stephanie. Shout out Stephanie. <laughs> Man, Stephanie had us right where we needed to be. We went right. crazy. Yeah. We yeah. went crazy. Yeah, she hooked us up, man. I would say it was like a kid in the candy store. He was, man, <laughs> a smile from ear to ear. Yeah, man. She hooked us up, man. She walked with us for a few hours, man, for, for a long time. You know, this they are they are definitely used to walking in Cuba, man. They are definitely <laughs> used to walking. So I mean, right. we walked, we walked a lot, man. We walked for hours, but Stephanie walked around with us for hours, man. It took us exactly where we needed to go. If we didn't find what we wanted at this store, she knew exactly where the next store was. And yeah, man, it was it was um it was hard for me to walk around with so many people in need as they were and you know asking us for for money. Like they can see the that we are Americans or they at least know that we're not Cubans. They know we're not Cubans. They know I think they know that we are Americans. So they are just, you know, every everywhere we went, people are asking for money. It's, it's difficult to turn down women and children, though. And, you know, she she talked to us about, you know, her son and her needing to make money, basically that she needed us to, uh, to accept her taking us on this tour. Um, Man, it was it was yeah. So I'm glad I'm glad we we met Stephanie. Shout out Stephanie. I'm glad that she yeah. got a chance to walk around with us and uh, take us to the things that we needed to get. Uh, you know, we were able to, you know, tip her really well. So and then we end up seeing her again uh, on our trip, and you know, she walked around with us again for probably four or five, six hours again. So you know, and we were able to tip her really well again. So. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad. I'm glad we had that experience with Stephanie. Yeah. Shout out to Steph. Like, the stuff was so dope. So we go the first day, right? We find all the stuff. Now there are. I don't want to just call them pots because it's not just a pot. It's like a pot and a big old heavy stand and this big elaborate thing um, that his priest will put our our ephi in, right? And so we're getting all these things like. Uh, the first day we met Stephanie. But when I see this thing, because so the Nigerian version is called uh, a Nigeri pie. And they'll be like carved on it, all, you know, different things, you know, somebody will be like a person, and the person will be holding the bowl, and then the bowl is where you'll put your king, all this dope stuff, right? And um, they don't quite look like that, but they're like big old bowls, and then they'll have like a big old heavy stand you know, that it'll sit on. And so um, we see that, we get our stuff and we keep thinking to ourselves like, man, that'd be crazy for us not to take one of them. Like for us not to both have one of them and go back, like it's crazy. But I'm talking about it's, it's big and heavy and it's like, nah, we, we can't do it. There's no way we can, we can take it back. But it's just played in our head like the whole next day. So after we come back from the B, I'm like, man, I think we can do that. I said, all we, like, we can do as a carry-on, we can just find, you know, buy a, a duffel bag and then we could put the stand in there and then the bowl, we can just check, you know what I'm saying? 
And so, man, we let that play in our hands. So we went on a whole nother mission. So I had exchanged number with Stephanie. Cause I'm like, yo, Stephanie, we might need you again. She like, bet, just hit me up. Um, so, <laughs> so I told Osha, I had been there. You know, this is my second time. I'm like, man, I can kind of figure out. I can't take you exactly where she took us, but I can take it to the area. So we get the next day we get back to that area, right? And I'm like, it can't be to the left, because the buildings are nicer over there. And this is like, they're older. So I'm like, it got to be this way. But I don't want to have us on a wild goose chase. At that time, we going back and forth. I happened to turn on the, uh, the hot spot. And Stephanie had called me. But Stephanie lost her, her, her phone either got lost or stolen. So she didn't have her phone. So what she would do is, she had my number. So she would stop people at random times after they use the phone real quick and hit me on the WhatsApp. Two minutes after I turned it back on, Stephanie called me. So I answered the phone. I'm like, yo, Stephanie, where are you at? Like, yo, we need you. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm over by the same place. I'm like, meet us at the Capitol. So we went to the Capitol. We met Stephanie. And then, boom, we was on a wild goose chase trying to find a duffel bag. Mm -hmm. And uh, at some point, I decided, man, I'm going to just put mine in my check bag because I got two bags and both of them was like half full. But we found Oshayuna bag and then we went and we did all that stuff and we got all together. And then Stephanie found us a place for somebody to keep our bag so we can keep walking around. We went, I mean, I'm talking about the thing that the, the base our base is probably weigh what, 35, 40 pounds? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say, at least 30 pounds. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying? So we ain't about to, like I said, we walking seven miles a day on that. So we ain't about to carry that all around. So right. we put that to the side. And then, um, you know, she walked, you know, she found a place that will hold our stuff and they held our stuff. And we out there in the streets moving around. And then she took us back. And both times, she went with us to the house. Like, she rode in the taxi, made sure we got in our building, and then, you know, took the taxi back to, you know, where she was going. And like I said, man, she was stand up. So, Stephanie, I know you're not watching this, <laughs> but <laughs> just so happy that you happen to fall, you know, um, on this video, man, we appreciate you, man. We really do, yeah, we appreciate you. Man. Yeah. So, anything else you want to say about Cuba before we wrap this up? Man, it was a, it was a, it was a beautiful trip. Uh, I and I feel like I'm being uh, called by my ancestors, my my bloodline ancestors, to really look in the Palo. So I'm a uh, uh, staying in contact with uh, my boy Rona about uh, Palo. I'm going to be talking to him about Palo, learning about Palo. He's a Tata uh, over there, so. That he's a priest of uh, Apollo over there. So I'm talking back and forth with him, learning as much as I can about Apollo now, because I know that my uh, earliest ancestors here in the Americas practice uh, practice Apollo, and I feel like I'm being called to practice Apollo myself. So yeah, man, I, I eventually would like to go back and get at least get scratched into Apollo over there. But yeah, man. So I plan on I plan on definitely going back. I, hopefully, I can learn a little bit of Spanish by then. Uh, mm -hmm. Rona Rona told me that it's not a prerequisite for me to learn Spanish um, because of him, though. Because of him, so it's not a prerequisite for me to learn um, Spanish. But he was like, you know, I'm the only person in my house that speaks English, so it would be good for you to at least learn some Spanish. So that will at least be. My focus is to learn at least a little bit of uh, Spanish and at least get scratched at some point. Yeah, I think I gotta work on my character a little bit more before I think about getting scratched. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, I'll be catching fades if I have. No, I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm playing. No, I'm serious for real. But um, yeah. but yeah, man, Cuba was dope, man. The second trip. Definitely um, 
surpass the first trip. Um, just the things that I was able to see, the experiences I was able to have. It was beautiful, man. You know, it was a beautiful mm-hmm. trip. I have a pretty strict policy against going back to countries that I've already been to. Right. But there was so much left for me to see and experience in Cuba. So, man, I enjoyed it. And we would tell y'all, man, look, go to Cuba. Go to Cuba, do your research. Going to Cuba is not like going to any other country um, because you can't use your credit card. Um, there, there's no Uber, you know, so uh, there's some restrictions on it. Like I said, Google Maps not going to work. So, you know, uh, I don't think, I don't think I was able to really get Google Translator to work too great while I was out there either. So, you know, there's a couple, but I'm not saying that to be a deterrent. Like, you will be more than fine, nonetheless, oh, yeah. you know, without those things, right? Just understanding those things, you know, before you get there. Also, one of the, for me, the biggest difference is, you know, don't exchange your money at the airport. You know, the rate right. ain't the rate like it is everywhere else. You know, so mm-hmm. if you do that, you'll be struggling. If you're American, you know, um, no ATM machines. You're not going to be able to take any money. So bring all the money that you, you know, that you need and then add some more on top of that. So, but our Airbnb host was great, you know, um, helped us with a lot of different things, excursions. And then Airbnb itself had a lot of different excursions. That's how I was able to find uh, about two or three of the things that we did, you know, was all through Airbnb. So I think I'm going to check out Airbnb and, and their excursions when I go to other countries now just because of the Cuba trip. But it was beautiful, man. It, it's, man, there's no racism, you know. Like everybody pretty much has some African in them as somewhere. Mm-hmm. So you got a lot of black people like us. You had a lot of people where you like, oh yeah, you, you definitely got some black people somewhere. And um, it was just amazing, man. Uh, the last thing that I want to say about Cuba that, is, that really exemplifies how they are is the the Babalawa that we met in the airport. We exchanged numbers. Um, he hit me up and said, hey, y'all need to come come meet me at this, I don't know, kind of bar club type of thing, but they had live music, they had some some Arisha performances and the whole nine, so we went to go see that. But it's like a bar, you know, people, you know, it's a bar, you know, bar Mm -hmm. club situation. You had kids. Right. You had people in there from from two to 82. Right. (laughs) In that place, all together, you know, drinking, dancing, laughing, having a good time. Man, I was just like, wow. And and again, South American and African countries, that's not, you know, uh, weird. Um, especially when you're in places where they're more traditional. You know, sometimes in some of the major cities, again, you get a lot of Western influence. But, man, you go somewhere traditional, you're going to see everybody partying together. So... Mm-hmm. That was a beautiful thing about that, man. And like I said, man, Cuba is a beautiful, beautiful country. So go there. Um, But, man, yeah, thank y'all for checking us out. You know, uh, don't come back next week because we will not be here. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Yeah, yeah, because, like I said, we still on break. But, man, we grinding, man. We got, man, we got some... Some things lined up for y'all, man, when we when we get back on. We got a lot of great information, a lot of beautiful people who are going to come and, and bless us. So thank y'all, man, for, for showing up. We appreciate you. We can't wait yeah. to, to get back locked in. You know what I'm saying? So love y'all. Peace. Peace.